So, Victor, the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead with, uh, with your introduction and we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you, Oren. Uh, I think that uh, my introduction will be maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes or uh, up to half of hour, not more. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it's the uh, most interesting thing to try to answer questions. And uh, I hope it's, it will be a lot of questions because topic is really hot. Um, okay. Uh, when we're talking about Russia's attempt to uh, interfere in, in the elections in the United States, but uh, as we could uh, uh, like conclude today, uh, it's uh, not only about elections in uh, United States, it's in general about possibilities of uh, uh, Russia or Moscow or Kremlin to uh, made influence to election uh, processes uh, in different uh, countries around the world. Um, from my point of view, first of all, it's uh, uh, needful to uh, talk about uh, kind of modus operandi of uh, Russia and modus operandi of uh, uh, modern Russian propaganda. Here you could uh, see some quotations uh, I will start uh, from conception of Mark Galeotti, and uh, I am agree with Mark Galeotti when he writing that uh, Russia is uh, possibly quite unique state today because uh, it uh, weaponizing everything. And uh, this book of Mark Galeotti uh, published a few years ago, uh, title of book, Weaponization of Everything, and it's about uh, modus operandi of Russian Federation. And uh, of course, this everything means also information. And uh, even I could say, uh, maybe firstly, uh, information because uh, Russia traditionally have uh, uh, quite big experience uh, from Soviet time when uh, propaganda, <coughs> sorry, propaganda and disinformation actions was like a, a part of a official uh, policy of a state. Um, but uh, also, of course, uh, we, uh, uh, we should keep in mind that uh, modern Kremlin propaganda, it's not a copy or not only copy of uh, the Soviet propaganda. Uh, we have also some new elements uh, in it, and uh, I will talk about it uh, too. Uh, also, today, I think it's uh, no needs to... Uh, to prove that uh, Russia acting in this information sphere and acting uh, against the uh, Western world uh, like a hostile power, I could say, and try to uh, make influence to uh, another countries and to uh, societies of another countries uh, to achieve uh, own goals. And uh, I really uh, uh, like this uh, last quotation for uh, Keir Gilles. It's um, maybe more about this um, uh, uh, Russian propaganda in general, <laughs> but uh, uh, this world, uh, how it presented in uh, Russian uh, TV, or I could say in general in uh, Russian or Kremlin uh, supported media, it's absolutely, uh, kind of uh, virtual image of the world. And I could um, prove it himself. Uh, I'm uh, exploring uh, this Kremlin propaganda during uh, last few decades. First of all, I uh, start to write about uh, this uh, challenge, uh, this problem as a journalist. And uh, later it became a uh, subject of my uh, scientific uh, researches and uh, scientific work. So really, if you working with these narratives, if you going and uh, reading uh, uh, some kind of uh, outlets like uh, RT or Sputnik, uh, after that, uh, even if you understand 
but uh, it's not true. It's uh, a lot of fakes and a lot of manipulation. You feel kind of uh, inf influenced uh, because it's uh, uh, massive of information. It's a lot of uh, information, disinformation and uh, uh, different kind of uh, manipulations. And really it's uh, like a, a alternative uh, image of uh, all world around you. And um, uh, it's uh, it is quite uh, influential. Uh, I could see, and uh, I think that everyone who tries to watch Russian TV uh, could also agree uh, with me. But another question is um, about um, um, like uh, roots of uh, this influence and. Uh, in general, uh, roots of this modus operandi of uh, Russia, and I mentioned that uh, it would be a mistake to say that, uh, you know, modern Russian propaganda, it's similar like a Soviet propaganda, they just uh, uh, like a turn on this engine uh, uh, again, um, because um, when we're trying to compare uh, modern Kremlin propaganda and uh, with uh, Soviet time propaganda, one of the main uh, differences uh, is that um, uh, during Soviet times uh, and during uh, Cold War or First Cold War, because we could say that uh, in one or an, another uh, like a position, we we back to situation of uh, Cold War today. Uh, but uh, during this uh, classical court and cold war it was uh, like a very clear struggle uh between ideologies uh in soviet union and in general in soviet bloc uh, eastern europe uh, which uh, moscow controlled um it was um ah, of course first of all communist ideology also uh, planning economy uh, which is opposite to free market uh, and it was quite um, quite clear ideology uh, differences uh, compared to to Western world. Uh, today it's hard to say. Does Russia have a kind of new clear ideology? Because in general, if you're looking to um, to this uh, rhetorics of uh, Russian authorities, uh, Russia uh, recognized free market. Of course, it's uh, some some problems with free markets uh, because of uh, um, also this political influence to to market and uh, criminal influence to market in Russia. But in general, they agree that uh, yes, it should be a free market. We also are uh, talking about uh, democracy, but about uh, sovereign democracy, it means another kind of democracy compared to Western liberal democracy. But uh, uh, for me, it's uh, every time it's quite, quite funny because uh, my position that it's uh, uh, democracy is democracy. And uh, if you trying to find uh, another ways to talk about uh, this democracy you're not talking about democracy you're talking about authoritarian uh, rule um, but uh, today uh, also why, why this question is important because we, when we're talking about uh, this propaganda or uh, disinformation uh, action of uh, russian federation uh, today uh, it's um, a little bit complicated because during uh, this uh, Cold War era, it was quite uh, obvious that it was ideological struggle and uh, that uh, Soviet Union tried to prove that uh, uh, the Soviet style of life and uh, Soviet ideology is only one uh, uh, right ideology, only one uh, right uh, way to live. Sorry, it's my cat. <laughs> interrupt a little bit i i will i will back to the presentation uh she always try try to help me uh, I, I have the same problem too Victor. yeah okay. yeah so so i, I back to to ideology and to to, to to this question of uh of ideology it's uh i don't ah 
subtitles, automatical subtitles. Okay, but um, and today uh, one of uh, like uh, theories about this Kremlin uh, propaganda says that uh, uh, Russia even uh, not try to prove that I don't know this Russian way of life is the best, but uh, Russia trying to undermine in general uh, principles of uh, uh, truth or like this situation of so-called post-truth when uh, some beliefs and um, uh, even uh, like um, emotional uh, evaluation of uh, facts are more important than, uh, than uh, compared to facts itself. Uh, and uh, but often Russia just trying to create a kind of house of information or house of disinformation uh, where uh, audience, where people uh, could just uh, lose, uh, lose himself yeah, but when you're not sure what is true, what is not, and uh, when you uh, losing this position of truth, when uh, you losing this uh, uh, understanding what is true and what is not, uh, it's very easy to manipulate your um, or to, uh, your position, your opinion. You could became. Uh, like a very easy object of manipulation. If you have no of these uh, pillars of uh, understanding what is true and what is uh, not. And uh, uh, when we're going to, to this question of um, uh, interference, uh, interference uh, to uh, uh, United States elections, uh, of course, I want, first of all, mention the situation of uh, uh, elections in 2016 and uh, here we could uh, just uh, look to subject yeah of this uh, 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 like a, of this case when it just uh, mentioned that it's about online trolling uh, of false presentation of uh, corrupt practice and so on and uh, my point here, would be, uh, or my point is that uh, in general, I believe that in 2016, this uh, actions of uh, Russian Federation, the goal was not to, I don't know, put uh, Donald Trump into White House or or do something. Uh, I think that uh, Russian Federation um, uh, have no like a. Uh, no plan to uh, put one or another candidate in White House, but we just want to affect uh, uh, beliefs of, uh, first of all, of course, uh, society of United States and uh, this trust uh, in democracy. But uh, mm, uh, what it means, you, you know, uh, elections for democracy is, uh, I could say, most important pillar. Yeah, it, it means it's a, a process of democracy itself. Uh, and if you could affect belief of people, but uh, you know, uh, election not uh, fire, but election uh, results of elections possibly uh, was falsificated and or not true. It means that. Uh, people uh, will start not believe in democracy. And for, for democratic uh, countries, of course, it's, it's quite a uh, big problem. So uh, this Internet Research Agency, yeah, the, uh, I also think that it's needful to say a few words about uh, this Internet Research Agency, uh, which was uh, behind this um, in, uh, like um, influence or attempt to, to influence uh, this uh, United States elections. Uh, it's structure created uh, by uh, Evgeny Prigozhin. Uh, Evgeny Prigozhin uh, is uh, uh, already uh, like, uh, uh, he died uh, uh, last year with uh, 
very strange in, in very strange situation but Evgeny Prigozhin was a very close ally of president of uh, uh, Russian Federation Vladimir Putin and uh, he is more well known as a creator of so, so called Wagner group it's uh, like a kind of private uh, a military company but in in Russian style and in general it was proxy power in uh, Syria, in Ukraine, uh, in Africa, in Central Africa uh, Republic. And um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin uh, finally tried to like uh, 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 it, it it was a rebellion, yeah, of, of Evgeny Prigozhin. Uh, Victor, uh, yeah. um, just for the sake of time, because we still want to answer some questions, I say we will move forward a little bit faster with the slides okay. because we we really want to sum up the introduction in about five seven minutes. Ah, okay, uh, well, so, 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 so we run through the slides. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so so short introduction. So, but uh, but what is important? What uh, today we also uh, have like a case few days ago. It uh, uh, it was news uh, that uh, uh, United States Department uh, of State's Diplomatic Security Service uh, looking for information about uh, uh, Rebar uh, Group. Uh, and, and it's also associated with uh, Evgeny Prigozhin uh, structures, and it means that in general, uh, today we could say that um, uh, Russia trying to repeat the situation of 2016, and uh, also a few short slides, I, I just look to uh, what kind of uh, disinformation uh, Russia uh, trying to put to information space, I, I used uh, EU versus Disinfo database. It's, it's quite a good database of European Union when they uh, like uh, trying to uh, present main narratives of Kremlin propaganda. So it's quite interesting, but it's uh, in general it's conspiracy about so-called deep state and it's con conspiracy theory, and uh, it seems like it's uh, main. Uh, narrative of disinformation in context of uh, uh, this year elections, uh, but also it's quite interesting how uh, uh, Kremlin propaganda trying to uh, uh, create so-called uh, uh, mirror view, as I call it, uh, when uh, Kremlin propaganda <laughs> accused United States and Western world in general, but it's not Russia trying to uh, affect uh, elections somewhere, but it's Western world affecting elections everywhere in in Georgia, in Moldova, in Azerbaijan, um, and so on. And uh, my like a short con conclusions, but uh, this uh, uh, objectivity is uh, uh, even not result of elections, but uh, actually election process and uh, uh, trust in the election process, uh, objectivity of this action of Kremlin propaganda uh, and uh, Kremlin disinformation efforts uh, general to create some kind of house uh, with, uh, for information landscape to confuse public. Uh, of course, it's better to do using some kind of conspiracy theories, uh, uh, just eroding the social trust in government and uh, uh, in general, uh, what's the main aim of Kremlin pro propaganda uh, to create, uh, to affect uh, societies in Western world to be quite paranoid, distrustful, and so on. So uh, sorry for, for my long introduction. I, I am like a teacher in university and I could uh, talk one and a half of hour <laughs> without stop. <laughs> yeah. I think it's fascinating. And if you can go back to that slide with conclusions. Uh, yeah. Um, I want to touch on that point, the last one, mm -hmm. and that is, I understand the aim the Kremlin has in terms of what they're trying to achieve with Western societies, but what is the general goal of behind a trying to achieve a society that is polarized 
a society that is paranoid, uh, distrustful, dis disillusion. Like, do they believe this is going to weaken Western governments for what purpose? What is the final aim in 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 all of this? Um, you, you know, I could say, but uh, of course, it's very hard hard to say exactly what is in the mind of Vladimir Putin or people near Vladimir Putin. But uh, uh, some signals just showing that um, uh, Vladimir Putin or this uh, uh, nowadays uh, Russian political regime, uh, they see world like a, a kind of battlefield, yeah, where its uh, main po powers... Uh, uh, are in battle and uh, Russia also, of course, Russia represents uh, itself like a, one of the main powers together with uh, China. I think so. Uh, of course, uh, there are some opponents, it's the Western world, but uh, for example, if you look into this Kremlin propaganda, quite often you could uh, see that even not NATO organization is main opponent of uh, uh, Russia in these uh, narratives of um, Kremlin propaganda, but United States, only United States and NATO uh, sometimes just represents like a, its organization, like a pu uh, uh, puppet of uh, United States. Yeah, and Western Europe is not important because the United States uh, is behind everything in these uh, <laughs> pictures of a world uh, uh, of Kremlin. Uh, and of course, uh, there are also some some another powers like uh, India. Uh, I think so. Uh, Africa in general, like uh, um, like a continent. So <laughs> main goal, of course, it's um, like a uh, uh, Kremlin thinks that it's really it's World War Two, World War Three. Sorry, already going on. It's not direct war, but it's kind of global. A global struggle and uh, this is just to affect uh, this uh, societies of enemy and uh, yes to 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 make uh, to make this enemy uh, weak how much did the war in ukraine impacted the disinformation campaigns that russia is is initiating and launching how much did the war in Ukraine is became the the main topic um, of their disinformation campaign, if 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 at all? Uh, yeah, of, of course, war in Ukraine, and uh, I'm quite often using like a, another like a formula, but it's a war of uh, Rush, uh, war of uh, Russian Federation against Ukraine. Yeah, <laughs> to to just clarify it, who who is aggressor and who is a victim here. Uh, of course, it's affected Kremlin propaganda. Uh, it's affected, first of all, propaganda which goes uh, to uh, Russian audience. Yeah, because uh, uh, we should also keep in mind that uh, when we're talking about uh, this Russian propaganda, uh, uh, victims of this propaganda are not only some, I don't know, uh, Western states, but uh, Russia also using propaganda to like uh, manage own audience manage people in in the uh, inside of russian federation and of course uh, russia tried to explain explain why moscow start this of course uh, in general propaganda not using this world war uh we're talking about special military operation which is uh, like a, uh russia not starting wars and russia just trying to do something it means with uh, special military operations <laughs> so clarification it's also but uh, first of all in in, in my narratives it's also not uh, war against ukraine it's war against this western world and uh, a war against the united states which using ukraine like a proxy states ag a state against russia so it's one of main narratives uh and uh, of course russia trying to represent this war like uh, russia trying to defend itself <laughs> uh against this uh, in in this global uh, global confrontation uh, also it's uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, like uh, different nuances because uh, this uh, uh 
context of war uh, created a lot of uh, very uh, strange narratives uh, about about Ukraine. For example, that uh, Ukrainians tried to create a biological weapon which uh, uh, will affect only like a uh, ethnical Russians, and it's it's absurdic narrative because uh, from scientific point of view it's uh, not possible to do. And uh, uh, for me personally, it's uh, uh, every time very big question. For example, uh, if looking to my ethnical uh, like uh, roots, I'm also I'm uh, uh, quarter Ukrainian, quarter Russian, quarter Belarus. So how this weapon should affect me? <laughs> Kill all, only quarter of me, or or how? Yeah, because uh, and also you, uh, if you um, hypothetically will create this uh, this kind of weapon, it's uh, it's uh, it hypothetically could kill uh, half of Ukrainian people because it's also no no uh, like a, uh, some ethnical Russians uh, uh, in Ukraine. So, so it's abs absolutely uh, it's kind of absurdic narrative, but we're using it. Uh, so it's a lot and, of and peculiarities. I, yeah, and I think it's 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 interesting that we see that um, that the Russians are using what well somebody say a spaghetti method, mm -hmm. whatever catches against the wall they'll keep using it. And I heard other uh, IO. Uh, experts saying it doesn't really matter if if it's even five percent successful as long as it's background noise creating more adding to the chaos so it's like they're looking at it as if it's like a big flame and they're just throwing fuel at it at, on a consistent basis as long as it's consistent that's the goal so it's not about quality it's about ongoing consistency would, mm -hmm. would that be a good description of the modus operandi in the sense of why we're seeing so many absurd sometimes we look at it and we say this is absurd yeah. but in the bigger picture it makes sense why they're doing it from a volume point of view yeah I, i'm totally agree and it's uh, exactly that i talk about this uh, goal to create this house of information different kind uh and in this house you could use everything facts fakes uh some like uh, fantasies uh, and so on yeah from from your perspective from your knowledge the use of russian propaganda and information operations that's something that intensified um under putin i would say in the last 15 years would that be would that be correct to say that like it's it's something that's i would say is a very putin centric it's very associated mm -hmm. with him would that be correct um uh, you know uh, not really because uh, and also uh, I, I, I could I, I could explain uh my dissertation uh was uh, about uh image of Baltic states in Russian periodical press in period of 1991 till 2009 uh, and uh, I could say that uh, some kind of uh, like information war for propaganda, but only against uh, Baltic states, it means Lithuania, Latvia and uh, Estonia. Uh, I find uh, quite a lot of uh, this stuff in uh, Russian media, uh, even during Yeltsin time. Yeah, but it was not so obvious. Uh, Russia use these uh, techniques of uh, like uh, information warfare, I could say, uh, against um, uh, territory which, uh, or states, which it, it was special term in, in Russia, it's near abroad. In, in general, it's post-Soviet area. And uh, I could say that uh, these uh, tools of, of propaganda based started to like uh, 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 to try or to uh, uh, just uh, using uh, against uh, this uh, states uh, neighbor uh, in neighborhood first of all and it uh, it was not so visible uh, in the west and not so visible in the western world and I could remember uh, times when also, 
we in Baltic states and Poland also, experts in Poland, uh, we try try to say to our colleagues in Western world, but look, it's it possibly it is problem and it could be a problem for your countries too. This uh, modus operandi of Kremlin in uh, information space and the answer was what you know you you are paranoid about Russia you looking to Russia of course we understanding your historical experience which is not not, not very nice with Russia but you know Russia it's not Soviet Union Russia changing and it's kind of your paranoia yeah but what are you talking about and uh, unfortunately uh, after Crimea first of all I think uh, this position changed, and not unfortunately, this position changed, but unfortunately, Crimea show what we, we was right. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I want to be wrong in this situation, but, but we, we was right about uh, this modus operandi of Kremlin. And uh, just during uh, last uh, 15 years, and especially last 10 years, uh, when we're looking uh, from this point of annexation of Crimea, because uh, I think that it was point when Russia uh, just de decided that uh, it's not important to be part of this uh, Western structures or to keep uh, uh, this relation with Western world. To Russia could be like independent player on this uh, geopolitical chess uh, uh, plate. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, last ten years, especially, show this uh, grow up of. Uh, so yes, Crimea two thousand fourteen was like the turning point, where uh, where Russian information operation campaigns move from targeting only what you call the near broad countries, former USSR countries, i.e. Baltic states, etc., to the international arena targeting 2016 elections, targeting elections in, in the West, targeting social cohesion in the West and so on. So that was like a turning point that coexists mm -hmm. together and match together with a bigger strategy, which is Russia as, as a bigger player in international affairs and the West as, a, as an adversary, uh, which Crimea represented that kind of like the, the, the moment where this shift happened. Would that be correct to say? Um, maybe... Uh... Correct, say that uh, Crimea became point when this <laughs> uh, attention to Russian uh, modus operandi uh, in Western world. Uh, it was turning point for Western world to uh, mm. like, uh, uh, to look to, to to these processes and to recognize that uh, we have these uh, processes. And um, for turning point of uh, like a Russian Federation, it's hard to say, but uh, in general, also I could say that in one or another way, uh, yes, it also was turning point for Russia because uh, Russia uh, possibly did not expect uh, like a, a so harsh reaction of Western world uh, to annexation of Crimea. Because we could remember that it was in 2008, uh, was this five days war in Georgia? Yeah, when Russia in general not not occupied directly territories of Georgia, but recognized uh, so-called uh, uh, South Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia like independent states. It's, it's part yeah. of its territories of Georgia, and it was like a um, uh, very soft reaction of Western world to this action of Russia. And I think that Russia believe that also Crimea, also Western world uh, would say that, okay, yeah, you, you made it. It's a bad thing, but you made it. But the reaction yeah. was more harsh. And uh, I think that the uh, Russian Federation made decision that, okay, let's be confrontation with Western world. You, you touched on the point of Georgia, and I want to touch on that and, and Moldova. So let me divide this question and ask you to if you can answer shortly on both. So what is the, the Russian trying to achieve in Georgia when it comes to their information operation campaigns? What are their goals there? And what kind of uh, methods do you see them using that are unique to the Georgian case? Um, 
I'm not especially expert on Georgia or Moldova, but uh, I, I know so, something yeah, uh, about, about uh, this region in Georgia. Um, uh, I think that uh, what Russia is using, it's uh, fear and what it means. Uh, today, I also uh, write uh, an article about uh, election and referendum in Moldova for one of a magazine in Lithuania. And uh, one of my points is that, uh, you know, uh, in general, in Moldova and in Georgia, for example, it's support of this idea of uh, European integration, but, but of course, the results of the referendum in Moldova show what uh, society is split in general 50-50. Yeah, it's uh, only uh, less than one, one person in, uh, during referendum, uh, like um, vote for uh, changes of constitution, which is needful to uh, Moldova to join European Union. But uh, I think that a uh, very important point here is uh, fear, and it's uh, connected uh, even not to Kremlin propaganda, but to this geopolitical situation, to uh, war of uh, Russia against Ukraine. Because people in Moldova and Georgia uh, are afraid that if Moldova or Georgia will show very clearly what they are going to, uh, to this uh, choosing this Western vector, we're going to European Union and possibly to NATO, as Georgia ha had this goal, um, uh, at least in the, the, in the past. So uh, it's possible that uh, uh, Russia will try to, will also attack Georgia or Moldova, and it will be war. So it's, it's better to see it very silently, yeah, not not to show your aspirations and try just survive here in this uh, like an unstable region where uh, uh, war is just next door. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, it's one of the effects, uh, which uh, even not propaganda but war, uh, like um, uh, doing to this region. Also. Uh, as I know, Russia using, uh, uh, first of all, kind of traditional narratives uh, about Europe, traditional narratives of Kremlin propaganda. It means that, okay, Europe, what means Europe? But it's uh, like, uh, first of all, uh, it's not Europe anymore. It's uh, this Russian world gay Europa. It means LGBT community size of power in Europe. And it's uh, like a main trend. In the in in like uh, social uh, relations in Europe, but uh, European Union it's uh, uh, kind of uh, like Soviet Union. It means it's a dictate of Brussels to all members. That uh, such uh, states like uh, uh, Moldova and Georgia will not uh, will never be equal in European Union because it uh, always will be some uh, like a rich countries which dictating uh, rules to poor countries and so on. It's uh, a lot of different narratives to also in, in general to grow up with fear fear of integration. You could say. I'm going to move now to the U.S. elections. Do you see any Russian attempts this time that are different than what we saw previously in previous U.S. elections? Oh, uh, it's a, a kind, kind of hard question because, of course, uh, this all activities uh, are undercover. Yeah, Russia not directly saying, look, I, I will try to influence this uh, election. Uh, from my point of view, it's quite quite interesting what they catch. Oh, it's not. It's interesting and it's natural at the same time, but they catch this uh, narrative of deep state, which uh, in general Donald Trump put in the in this information space, yeah. And uh, they're using it uh, a lot, as uh, show this uh, 
monitoring and database of uh, European Union Stratcom. So, uh, and it's quite powerful narrative. Why? Because it's uh, it's narrative that you know United States not democratic state. Yeah, it exists some kind of deep state like an authoritarian system which ruling with United States. Uh, and it's of course. Uh, uh, if if you can go to that slide that shows those narratives, I think yeah. you have a slide of like that that yeah. one the this, view. Yeah, yeah, but it's, this it's, one, this one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah but. Kamala Harris is like an actor of deep state, uh, but it will be not uh, not like a, not free elections and so on. It's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Kremlin trying to attack idea of democratic uh, election. And uh, so, what you're saying is that there's not so much change in the way that they are using this information. It's just that the narratives change. They are using new new narratives, yes. but. But I wanted to ask, do you see use of technologies such as AI for creation of contents uh, from, from audio to video to text? Um, do, do you see, uh, is that something that is being used by Russia in a way that is more concerning than what was available before? Um, not in, really. in, the, in the sense of the elections in the US. You, you know, not really, but I'm not specialist in this cyber domain. Yeah, so uh, it, it means that uh, I'm looking to narratives, first of all, uh, and uh, of course about this all new technologies, could more talk uh, specialist of, of cyber security. Uh, main trend is that, uh, yes, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, is using for creation of some deep fakes, yeah. Uh, when when you just could, uh, uh, like a like a uh, create some some video where where uh, president, for example, saying something. Mm -hmm. uh, it it, it uh, uh, there are some examples uh, in Ukraine or or in this action against Ukraine because uh, uh, it was few video. Uh, uh, with uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, which is Zelensky's wife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, and uh, uh, I'm not. Uh, I could say that uh, uh, I'm not specialist, but I believe that way using it because Kremlin using uh, everything that they could. And mm -hmm. and at that point. Uh, in the 2016 elections, we saw that there was uh, a cyber operation um, with the leakage of documentation to, uh, through uh, Assange and, and his WikiLeaks sites. Um, and, and it's usually uh, a hand in hand kind of a thing, this information operation working with cyber from, uh, uh, from a, an information retrieval and and, and penetrating for uh, systems and so on for, for spread. Do we see any uh, cyber? I mean, we know that the US prepared a lot on the cyber scale, a lot. But do you see anything that maybe show us that the Kremlin is thinking of some cyber capabilities um, that we see maybe somewhere else and, and, they're, and they're at least trying to use them? Uh, or, or anything like that? Have you seen anything like an indication for some cyber operation that may be going on or something like that? Uh, you know, um, maybe I will uh, I will answer to, to this question, even trying to to look wider to problem. Yeah, because in general, that means uh, uh, when we have at the same time, for example, cyber attacks and some narratives of propaganda, it may be uh, some, I don't know, economical actions. Yeah. Uh, in general, it's hybrid tactics. Uh, and uh, Russia uh, clearly is implementing these hybrid tactics. And uh, here maybe. Um, uh, I could uh, talk not about United States, but uh, about Baltic states. When we just uh, uh, saw last few years uh, that it was some uh, kind of uh, provocation in, in the real situation, it's not, not informational, 
uh, but some kind of provocation, uh, some kind of uh, uh, like a, a, a attempt of assassination of uh, representatives of uh, uh, Russian emigration. Uh, uh, people from 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 Russian political immigration in Baltic states, also some provocation uh, uh, against uh, symbols, yeah, against some monuments in in Lithuania, and also it's uh, in parallel uh, it it was some uh, information campaigns. So uh, uh, I could say uh, that. Uh, against Western world, including Baltic states, because, uh, because we, we are part of Western world today, uh, Russia using uh, different activities. And in general, we back with to this conception of Mark Galeotti, but Russia uh, trying to be weaponizing everything, everything that it could. So uh, I think uh, uh, it's quite well known that uh, uh, Russia have some these hacker groups which affiliated with special services of Russian Federation. Yes. And and uh, I think we we not sitting without work today. I I wanted to ask you about um, you you spoke about the, the the Russian groups, but one of the things we notice is that Russia is also exporting via groups such as Wagner. Mm -hmm their IO uh, operations and they're commercializing it. Uh, we, we're seeing it in Africa being used. Uh, um, we're seeing it elsewhere as well. What can you tell us about that commercialization of the IO by the Russian, uh, uh, by the Russian Kremlin? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that something that is uh, kind of an opportunist approach or is there, a, 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 I wouldn't say an ideology, but a strategy behind it? Uh, to gain influence and, and, and to get a foothold in those countries. Like, how can you explain that uh, that commercialization of IO that is taking place? You, you know, it's, it's really a very interesting question because I could say that, uh, you know, what this Wagner group or similar uh, private, like military companies, uh, which, by the way, uh, such kind of private military companies are illegal by Russian legislation. But they they acting anyway, so it's quite interesting. But Russia in general, uh, first of all, they copy this uh, uh, like uh, principles of private military groups, uh, copy from Western world, uh, like uh, they look to uh, Blackwater security or so on, so, so on. But they of course change it with uh, modus operandi because Wagner Group. Uh, uh, was proxy for Kremlin. Uh, it, it means that uh, for Kremlin it was very useful because uh, they sent with uh, uh, Wagner rebels to Syria, to Ukraine, to to Africa. Yeah, and uh, when it was like a uh, some one of uh, leaders of the world asking Putin, "What uh, what you doing in Africa or so so?" Far, Putin could say, "You know." We are not doing. We are doing in Africa nothing. It's just private company <laughs> doing something, and it's not about uh, Russian army. But it was quite well known that uh, goals uh, was implemented uh, according with Kremlin strategy, and I could say it's kind of Russian know-how. We. So, so we're seeing that uh, it's a know-how that that Russia um, has over the years. I would say uh, developed and and improved both in terms of uh, efficiency, both in terms of the ability to create massive scale uh, operations on a large scales globally. Uh, also, using uh, not only method but also tools that are being developed uh, and so on, and 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 to feed that. So the, the question is, at the end of the day, how do you combat that? How, how do you prevent, maybe not 100% success, maybe you cannot create 100% protection, but how can you uh, diminish the influence of those propaganda campaigns that the Kremlin is issuing, uh, and specifically towards the US election that is up and coming? Oh, it's... 
It's extremely good question, and uh, I'm quite often I'm joking, but if I will have answer, I would worth uh, like a Nobel uh, uh, Prize <laughs> for the peace. Yeah, but uh, in general, um, uh, I could say that uh, yeah, it uh, exists some mechanism. Of course, uh, when we're talking about this challenge of uh, disinformation and propaganda, it's uh, very important to uh, to like uh, uh, to fight this uh, house of information, and it means it's uh, very important uh, for society to know uh, where is facts and where is lies yeah, and where where is fakes. <laughs> so. Uh, media, uh, real media, not propaganda media, but real media uh, here have uh, own role. I'm talking about fact-checking initiatives. And uh, from my point of view, it's, it's very interesting. I also have background in journalism. You know, this uh, uh, checking facts, uh, it's always uh, was uh, this work of journalists. But today, fact-checking it be became kind of a separate genre for media. And it's 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 very interesting thing, uh, and of course, um, you know, in Baltic states, we're talking a lot about uh, needs of media literacy. It means that um, uh, uh, society should be quite resilient, uh, and uh, it means that people should um, uh, first of all uh, understand these challenges. Um, also, uh, people should be aware about these challenges and uh, people should have abilities to check information. And it's uh, very important, especially today, because we, we are living in the world of social media, for example, when uh, just users could uh, share uh, anything yeah, in, in this information space. And uh, it means that uh, uh, if you not checking uh, information, if you believe everything, yeah? and if you're sharing everything, you becoming this part of this misinformation. Yeah, it's, it's another term, not, uh, not, not disinformation, but misinformation, when people spreading disinformation because they believe that it's true. And uh, it's, it's also a problem. We're helping Kremlin, we're helping China, they could help, uh, I don't know, terroristic organization to spread some narratives in this way. We're we're ending the end of our time, so I'm going to ask one more question and then ask your your final thoughts. Um, and as a final question, I want to ask you specifically about the U.S. elections. Uh, do you see these uh, information operations that the Kremlin is operating, and also other countries, so China and Iran, are are said to be involved in this as well? Do you see them to be impactful? Do you see them to have any impact? Um, uh, are they successful or somewhat successful? Mm -hmm. Oh, mm. uh, also, to answer this question, uh, I think we, we should have like a global research <laughs> on it. And like a, like a researcher, uh, I always am very careful to, to, to say yes or not, uh, or no, if I have no, uh, no data from, from uh, research. Uh, in 2016, uh, it is, was like a evident that uh, impact was not uh, so important. Yeah, and uh, of course it's good because if it would be evidence that it was important impact, it means that uh, Kremlin just uh, I don't know undermined this uh, democratic elections in United States. Uh, I think it affects. Some, uh, some, it possibly affects some audience. Uh, it possibly affects some, some, some people. But uh, I also believe that uh, United States also uh, like uh, learn lessons from 2016. And as you mentioned, and I totally agree, but today United States uh, they are more prepared for such kind of activities than it was. Uh, it was eight years ago, yeah. So um, we have two more minutes. I want to ask your final thoughts um, or your kind of conclusions. You, you showed us your conclusions before mm -hmm. from your presentation, but 
if you have some final thoughts that you would like to share with the with the audience oh my my final i, I think that uh, we are living in the very interesting times uh we are living in uh, uh like an era of information uh and it means that uh, of course it's a lot of opportunities and uh, i like technologies uh technologies helps uh in our life but uh, at the same moment we uh every time and uh, uh, we should keep in mind that it's like these technologies also it's like a dark side of moon yeah we have this this dark side and means various opportunities it's always uh, appears new new challenges so we should keep it in mind Victor, thank you so much for today. Um, we, we haven't had all of the time to go over all the slides, but we are going to upload the slides and the transcript and the recording uh, um, from today's uh, webinar on our website and our blog and, uh, and shared on our social media. I want to thank you, Victor, for a very interesting webinar today, touching on a topic that is going to be, uh, I would say, in the headlines in the upcoming days as we're heading towards the U.S. elections on the 5th. And I want to thank the audience who joined us today. Uh, thank you, everybody. We will have more webinars in the upcoming uh, uh, month. Um, in November, we have a few more. Uh, I also encourage you to look at some of the webinars we had in the past, uh, the past month about other topics. So, Victor, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for the opportunity. Goodbye.